Yeah. So before the break, we um, stopped at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. So we will continue from verse 14 onwards. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. If we could have someone read out for us verses 14 to 18. Um, Philippians 2, 14 to 18, please. Yeah, if anyone has come back from the break and you have logged in, please, if you could unmute and read out for us Philippians 2, 14 to 18. Do all things 14. without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a good and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I been poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifices, on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice in me. Yes. So um, he says, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. Um, if you notice, complaining, disputing, quarrels, all of this generally comes out of an attitude of self-centeredness where your interests matter more than the interests of others. And that leads to uh, you know, complaining and uh, disagreements and quarrels. Um, in fact, we see that mentioned by James, you know, in James chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. If we could have someone read out that. Uh, because um, what he says over there in, in that portion, James, makes a lot of sense. So if someone could turn to James chapter 4 and read out for us verses 1, 2, and 3. James 4, 1 to 3, please. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Sorry, I'll take NKJV. I was reading KJV. Uh, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. That you may spend it on your pleasures. James makes a very valid point over here. He says... If you look at most of the infighting and the uh, quarreling and the disputing which goes on in any church setting, it's because of the desires that are at war inside the person. You know, they a part of them wants to serve the Lord and and uh, uh, have a godly uh, set of priorities, but then the other part of the believer uh, is filled with all these selfish desires. You know, where you want self-promotion, where you would like uh, to do things which would bring you personal pleasure rather than you know, serve the purposes of Christ. So he says, because of these attitudes, there's a kind of competition between all of you. You know, each of you wants to get those things that all of you are, uh, you know, um, craving for, maybe position and, uh, you know, influence and all of that. So you fight with each other, you compete with each other. Uh, he says you murder and covet and cannot obtain. So, I mean, obviously, they're not committing physical murder over here, but they're trying to drag each other down, you know, blackening each other's names so that um, uh, they can go further in this race of fame. Um, so they're doing all of this because of the um, selfish, self-centered, worldly desires that are there in them. And uh, James, in fact, he says, um, Yet you, you know, you do not. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. 
so you you fight among yourselves you have all these worldly goals and you want to reach them and you fight with each other to be able to get these worldly goals and uh, instead of asking to asking the lord you know to lift you up in his time instead of asking the lord to provide uh, whatever he considers right instead of depending on him and relying upon him you choose to start fighting with one another to gain whatever you can um and he makes a point and he says even when you ask you don't receive from the lord because you're asking for uh, so that you may spend it on your own pleasures you know um for instance you want to be lifted up to a higher position as an elder of the church why because it will add to your you know status not because you want to serve the church so uh, all of this he says it leads to wars and fights and competitions among you so here you know in in uh, in um, the philippian letter paul is saying almost uh, a similar thing he says do all things without complaining and disputing please don't let there be disputes and quarreling and competition among you because you need to be blameless and harmless um uh if you are hurting each other then you are a harmful person you're a dangerous person but that is not the way a child of god should be a child of god should be harmless not bringing harm or hurt to anyone and a child of god needs to be blameless no one should be able to point fingers at us because of the way we are conducting ourselves so if we are disputing with one another disagreeing with with one another because uh, i mean i want my opinion to finally win out in an argument if i'm having that attitude then i am harming the other believers and i'm in fact uh, bringing blame upon myself and the church through my attitude he says it's so important the attitude with which we conduct ourselves because you see we are living in a crooked and perverse generation that's what the whole world is doing out there you know fighting each other dragging each other down competing with one another grumbling and complaining about uh, each other they're doing all of that but we are supposed to be different we are supposed to be the lights shining in a dark dark world so when people look at us they should see us shining they should see that we are so different from them and that should make them wonder why is this person not competing the way i compete why is this person not opening their mouth and criticizing and condemning others the way i am doing and they should ask themselves that and they should want to come to christ so especially because we are living in such a dark world which is involved in this you know 24/7 in dragging each other down in 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 trying to backstab one another in trying to uh you know lift themselves up and promote themselves when we are living in such a dark dark world if you have even a small handful of people who are standing apart and living so differently then automatically they shine and everyone notices so he says we need to be very careful about our conduct because we are those little lights shining in a very dark world in a very crooked and perverse world so we should not be like the world if we are like the world then we will be as dark as them and there would be no shining at all uh, you know so he urges the philippian believers uh, to be different to stand apart from the crowd and we see um, the early church leadership you know so beautifully actually exercising this um, i mean i'm always reminded of uh, you know uh, James the leader of the Jewish church and you know Paul who was the leader of the Gentile church you know when they meet up and they uh, they have to take decisions regarding um the ministry you know when Paul goes over there to Jerusalem the beautiful way in which they conduct it there's no competitiveness there's no disputing there's no you know okay my interests matter my church's interests matter that whole attitude is not at all there because you know james um, when paul goes over there james says see this is the situation that we are facing here there are thousands of jews who have come to the lord and for them the law is so important the most the mosaic law and james is like very frank you know he knows that paul has taken a stand against the mosaic law and paul has no interest in following it 
but he says you have come over here and now all these um, new believers are watching to see you know what are you going to say what actions you will take so therefore for their sake could you please go to the temple along with a bunch of other you know um, jewish uh, i mean people who have made some commitment go and take a vow along with them you know um, shave your head along with them because when you do that then all these new jewish believers who have uh, been added to the church they will see and then they will realize that okay you're you're also part of the kingdom of god and you're not crooked in any way or you're not evil in any way and paul obliges he doesn't say ah my belief system is different so i don't need to do that you know after all i mean uh, we don't need to follow the law he doesn't um, uh, grumble or fuss he says he understands that this is for the benefit of that you know new church which is growing among the jews so he agrees in fact he goes with those people in fact he pays for their uh, for their rituals and you know, whatever needs to be, whatever payment needs to be done he pays on their behalf and he undergoes those rituals along with them even though he is very very clear that uh, in no way is his salvation dependent on any on any of those things in the same way when it when you, you know when you look at james in the way he um, 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 treats the gentile believers you know he he says yeah we will not put all these pressures on the gentile believers they don't need to follow all of these things and so he he stands up in that jerusalem council and he uh, you know proclaims a decision saying that the Jew, the gentile believers don't have to follow any of these mosaic laws and then uh, they they just um, mention two or three things which you know the gentiles should observe one of course is to avoid uh, idolatry uh, the other is not to partake in uh, having anything which you know having any sacrificial food which has got blood in it and i you know basic things like that uh, so so james goes out of his way uh, to help the gentile church grow and paul uh, the leader of the gentile church he goes out of his way to help the Jew jewish church grow i mean look at the way they partnered with one another humbled themselves and submitted to one another they did this because they were not trying to promote their ministries they were interested in promoting jesus kingdom his church that is what mattered to them so paul didn't say this is my belief system so i don't need to go over there to the temple and do that he didn't say that in the same way james did not say you know uh, because the jewish believers will be affected you know let's impose the rules upon the gentiles no they cared for each other's churches so they demonstrated um you know that blameless harmless attitude which children of god should have and so they were like shining lights so the way they conducted themselves would have greatly influenced the new the new believers you know who were watching who were see who were watching to see how these leaders will conduct themselves when they when that when that whole crisis came you know about the jews and the gentiles and all of that so um Paul talks about having the importance of having the right attitude so that you will stand apart from the crowd and shine in this very very dark world you're the only light available in this very very dark world where all the principles and values and conduct to the people is so fallen and so when you stand apart and you portray Christ's values you automatically shine and people will we you know will we you you'll catch the attention of people and then they will want to know more about this christ that we are uh, following so um in verses 17 um 18 paul says um this is the imagery he uses over here he talks about himself as the drink offering he talks about the philippian uh, the ministry of the philippian believers as the sacrifice and service which they are offering to god and um, he says i am being poured out on the sacrifices which you guys are making you know it's like um, he's using the image of the uh, old testament sacrifices where you would have uh, the the sacrificial animal being brought and then you would have the drink offering poured on the sacrificial animal so he says the sacrifice and service which has been coming from your faith um you know that's something honorable to the lord it's a pleasing aroma to him and i am the drink offering which is being poured out on your sacrifices so it's like they both are beautifully partnering with each other to lift up christ church 
to build his kingdom so from their side the philippians are sacrificing making their sacrifices um you know uh, doing whatever they need to do to partner in the gospel and from paul's side he has we allowed himself to be arrested he is now you know facing imprisonment and is um, he's not sure whether he you know his life is going to end very soon because he doesn't know what the outcome of the of caesar's tribunal will be so he says it looks like i know i'm i'm being poured out like a drink offering and i'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifices which you have been offering to the lord he says because these philippian believers we saw that in philippians chapter 1 uh, verses 27 to 30 where he says you know don't be afraid of the opposition that you're facing he says continue to you know uh, share the gospel the way you have always done uh, so it give it gives us a hint about what these philippian believers were going through i mean the local population over there would not have been happy that these believers have gone away from the heathen ways and now they have become part of the christian church so they probably the believers were facing a lot of opposition now these are people who had roman citizenship and roman privileges and rights but now after becoming believers i'm not sure uh, to what extent they were allowed to even access those privileges and rights you know so maybe that's the reason why they became impoverished because i mean uh, people of philippi were not supposed to be really poor so if they have become that poor and you know in second corinthians uh, paul uh, refers to them and he says that they are extremely poor he says so maybe it's because they lost their rights and privileges you know maybe they were no longer um, being treated well by the uh, by the rest of the society so in uh, philippians 1 27 to 30 um, paul in fact uh, he urges the philippians and says do not be afraid do not be frightened by the opposition continue to hold on continue to share the gospel he says so these people were making sacrifices they were offering a fragrant sacrifice unto the lord a service unto the lord and paul from his side he was being poured out like a drink offering upon this how beautiful it would be if you know our churches could function like that where what we are all offering to the lord you know in our person in our own personal way in our own uh, spheres of influence if we are all serving sacrificially and then the leadership of the church what they are doing is also sacrificial so while we are all producing and providing the sacrifice those leaders are like the offering which is being poured out on the sacrifices which we are offering so all of us together are offering to the lord a fragrant uh, aroma you not know, together what we are offering rises up to him rises up to heaven like a fragrant aroma that is the way it should be full partnership at the congregation is not not just the audience they are also actively involved in ministry they are also doing whatever they can in their offices in their colonies so they are making their sacrifices they are offering their service the leadership on the other hand is also working very hard and so the people sacrifices and the leadership's offerings together combine to become one beautiful sacrifice and service unto the lord that is what the lord wants those are the kind of living sacrifices in which romans uh, chapter 12 talks about that uh, is the goal that you know we should all work towards and now um, he talks about two persons who re- who deserve special commendation um so uh, verses in verse 19 he talks about timothy and then uh, later on he goes on to talk about epaphroditus um so uh, dwelling a little bit upon uh, what he says regarding timothy um if we could have someone read out for us verses 19 to 22 about timothy specifically uh, philippians 2 verses 19 to 22 Well, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, 
but you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, and as soon as I see her, it goes with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yeah. Uh, so he wants to send Timothy to them, uh, to, you know, to encourage them, maybe to help them. Uh, and he gives him the highest compliment that he's ever given anyone. He says, I have no one else like him. So I imagine that this Timothy probably was just like Paul, very sacrificial, never putting his own interests first, always placing the interests of Jesus Christ first. I mean, now. Uh, he was probably a very exceptional man, which is why finally, you know, Timothy, I mean, uh, Paul appoints him as the leader of the Ephesian church, even though he's just a youngster. Because this man, Timothy, has proved himself in that manner where he places Christ's interests always first, never thinks about himself. He's so, you know, and, and uh, Timothy says about, uh, Paul says about Timothy, he says, who will show genuine concern for your welfare. So here is a man who cares about the name of Christ, about promoting Christ, and about uh, looking after the welfare of the people that, uh, that have been placed under him. He doesn't even think about his own interests. What an exceptional person. So Paul says, I have no one else like him. The highest compliment that Paul could ever give to anyone. You know, he says that about... Uh, Timothy, uh, because if you if you remember Paul, um, he 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 gives up so many rights and privileges uh, to to serve you know for, uh, to serve Christ. Um, if you if you if you remember the First Corinthian uh, you know passage uh, in First uh, Corinthians chapter nine, you know where he talks about how uh, you know we too have a right to expect payment for the ministry that we are doing. But have we ever taken any payment from any of you? You know, is what he says to the Corinthian people. Um, he says, uh, Peter and some of the other apostles, you know, they, they take their, uh, their wife along when they go on uh, ministry, tips, uh, ministry trips. But then he says, people in my team, you know, we, we don't even take our families along, even though we have a right to do that. Because then if they take their family along, then the church will have to, you know, provide for them and take care of them. So they don't want to burden the churches that they are visiting in that manner. And so they choose not to take their family members with them. They choose not even to ask for any payment or support. Rather, they themselves earn and they themselves support them, you know, uh, their food and um, lodging and all of that. So, um, uh, in in the, in the first corinthians 9 uh, passage uh, this is what he says um, or is it only i and barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living so they they do they do they they, they do their tent making on the side you know along with the ministry work which they are doing the entire day so that they will not be a burden to the churches in any way and um, um, he, this is what he, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11. He says, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? So he says, because we are spiritually providing for you, you have an obligation to actually provide for us materially. But we have never, ever asked uh, you know, uh, such things from you. Uh, so he says in verse 12, but we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything. He says, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So this Timothy was probably somebody like that who was willing to put up with anything so that the gospel of Christ will not be hindered. I mean, these are very high um, you know, uh, uh, values that are being, very high standards which are being placed for us. Are we people who will put up with anything to serve the interests of Christ? Are we people who will put up with anything to show genuine concern for the people who have been placed under us? Are we willing to put up with anything uh, to be able to serve Christ in that manner and to serve the church in that manner? So Timothy was one such person. And uh, so here he speaks highly of him. And he says, don't worry, I will send him to you soon. 
you know, so that you know you you will be benefited. And then uh, he goes on to talk about uh, Epaphroditus, the other person uh, that he wanted to specially mention, uh, because Epaphroditus was somebody from Philippi. He was basically from the Philippian church, but he had gone to Rome uh, to help Paul during his arrest and imprisonment. So he was probably serving um, Paul over there, you know, while he was under house arrest. Uh, he was serving him and uh, taking care of him and helping him with ministry matters because Paul was under arrest. You know, he would not be able to move around. He would be basically stuck in the place where he's been imprisoned. Uh, but the people who are with him would, would be able to move around and take care of ministry matters and assist in so many different ways. So Epaphroditus had gone from Philippi to help him over there. And then it says we get to know in this passage uh, what happens. And uh, that shows the level of commitment that this man had towards ministry. So if we could have someone read out those verses for us, uh, verses 25 to 30. Yeah, chapter 2, verses 25 to 30, please. Yet I considered it necessary to send you to Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, by your, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like when he was serving uh, Paul in Rome, uh, he became sick at some point of time. But then, you know, he didn't want to just leave and go back because he is sick, uh, because Paul needed him over there. And so he continues to stay over there in spite of his sickness until it almost affects him, uh, you know, uh, to a stage where he almost dies. Uh, so here again was another person who was willing to put up with anything so that he will not hinder the gospel in any way. So even though he is sick, even though he needs care, if he had gone back to Philippi, the Philippian believers would have looked after him. But he chooses to continue staying over here because if he goes away, who will be there to help out? Who will be there to take care of things? And so he continues over there and risks his life where, you know, he almost reaches the point of death. So that which is why uh, Paul says, you know, and, and it's generally believed that uh, the letter when it is uh, sent, uh, it's Epaphroditus who would have carried the letter back home, you know, to the Philippian uh, church. Uh, so um, he says, uh, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. And he says, honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, he says. Uh, so uh, in the next sentence, he says, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So he put his life at risk, continued to stay over there. He became sicker and sicker until it almost looked as if he would you know, die. Uh, so that is the way he served. So the kind of people who are talked about over here in this Philippian letter, very high, uh, uh, beautiful examples. I mean, uh, these are the kind of people that we should aspire to be. You know, so uh, are we serving in that manner? Are we willing to, you know, put up with the kind of opposition that these people were facing? And uh, uh, were they, uh, you know, the same way they were willing to not allow anything to come in the way of, you know, um, honoring Christ in serving the church? Are we willing to, you know, put up with anything in the same manner? All of these things are, uh, you know, matters that we would have to ask ourselves uh, because that is the kind of example which is being set for us, you know, in this uh, particular letter. So, um, 
moving on from there uh, into chapter 3 um, here now in this chapter 3 he touches upon this whole idea of uh, the judaizers like we saw in the introduction uh, there are no judaizers as such in the philippian church but paul is concerned that maybe you know they would come from galatia or, or from other places and start troubling the believers over here so he kind of wants to warn them about these people in fact it looks like he's already warned them about these people earlier as well but now he again makes mention of this topic because he is concerned uh, that they will you know come and create harm in this in this lovely church um, so um, looks like they were you know um, creating a lot of confusion wherever they went these judaizers uh, so we'll just look at three verses here um, if someone could read out for us the uh, verses one two and three of chapter three Yeah, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3, please. Finally, my, my brethren, brethren rejoice in the Lord. In... For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Yes. Um, so he says, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, which means earlier also on some other occasions, he's already talked to them about these Judaizers and warned them to stay away from these false teachings. He feels very strongly about this because, you know, he humbled himself, decided that he would only talk about Jesus and Jesus crucified and nothing else. And now here are these people who are saying that they have to add something to this crucified Christ. That you have to add something more and only then you will gain your salvation. So he finds that deeply distressing. And if people say that, you know, they want to trust in Jesus and also the law, that's not going to lead them to salvation. I mean, you've got to place your trust in, in Jesus alone. So what would happen is you would end up with an entire church of believers who think that they are believers and who are not even believers because they are placing their faith in law. They, 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 would, they, they believe that Jesus is not adequate, that what he did on the cross is not enough. So it would, it, would, it would destroy the entire church. I mean, none of those people would ever go to heaven. So it is a very um, distressing thing. So which is why Paul is uh, deeply troubled by these false teachers. So he again warns very, very strongly against them. And these are the terms that he uses. You know, he says, watch out for those dogs. That's the derogatory term that he uses regarding these people. He says, evildoers is what he calls them. And then he says, you know, watch out for the mutil mutilation. Or rather in the NIV, like it says, they are the mutilators of the flesh. So um, these are the terms that he uses when talking about the Judaizers and their teaching. Um, you know, as we know, um, dogs were not considered something um, respectable or noble in in um, in the Jewish culture. Uh, I mean, now we have a very different opinion of dogs. We consider them as you know man's best friend. We consider them as faithful and loyal. Uh, so for us, uh, this term does not make much sense. Uh, but then back then if someone were referring to a dog they would refer to that animal in a very in a most um, derogatory manner dogs were considered low they were considered unclean so imagine paul is using that term to refer to these um, uh, to these believers these fake believers who are promoting the mosaic faith rather than placing their faith in jesus work uh, on the cross alone Okay, so um, he says, watch out for those dogs. Now, it's true that some people kept dogs in their homes as pets, uh, but then that was very, uh, you know, very, very few in number. 
uh, most people uh, looked down upon dogs. Um, now, this was a term which was generally used for the Gentiles. If you remember, you know, um, in the Gospels, when Jesus has that encounter with that Syrophoenician woman, um, he makes a reference to that term which the Jewish people used to apply to the Gentiles. So he says, I have been sent to the children of, um, of uh, Israel. I have not been sent to the dogs, the Gentiles. So he deliberately uses that term, which the people of that time were applying to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were familiar with that. I mean, they knew that the Jewish people had a low opinion of them, that this is how they referred to them. They were very much aware of that. And in, on that particular occasion, Jesus deliberately use, uses that term just to see how she would respond. And then her response is amazing. I mean, Jesus is impressed greatly by her faith and the way she responds. Um, so um, this term dogs was a term that was used for Gentiles. The Jewish people used this term for the Gentiles because the Gentiles had not been given the Mosaic covenant. God did not come down to the Gentiles and say, I will make you my chosen people. You will be a set apart for me and I will do great miracles among you. I will provide for you. I will bless you. God did not come down and say that to the Gentile nations. He especially came and gave that status to the Jewish people. So the Jewish people always regarded themselves as superior, as somebody very exclusive. I mean, of course, God never intended them to think of themselves that way because he always made it a point, you know, when he gave them those uh, mosaic laws to say anyone who is willing to come and join you or your community, you are meant to welcome them. You're supposed to treat them in the right manner. And then after the third or fourth generation, you know, their descendants would be able to start att attending the temple, but they would become part of the Israelite community. So, I mean, there were all these rules and regulations given. So um, the Jewish people were never supposed to regard themselves as exclusive um, um, uh, in the sense, uh, regard themselves as, as superior. But uh, they kind of developed a superiority complex, and they looked down upon the others who had not been given the law. And if you remember, um, the two tablets uh, which are given uh, to Moses, God literally writes uh, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, with his own hand on those two tablets. So they are the nation, they are the only nation to whom something that was literally written by God's hand was given. You know, so no, no other uh, nation had that kind of a special status. So therefore, the Jews had a very high opinion about themselves, and they referred to the Gentiles as dogs. Now, here, what is Paul doing? He's turning the tables on them. He said, he says, you have always regarded the Gentiles as dogs, but now, if you hold on to this Mosaic law that you are so proud about, you know what? You will, you are going to end up with that status of dogs because the law can no longer deliver or save. So you will be on the same level as all the Gentiles whom you were condemning and regarding as you know outside the outside the you know the, the saving grace of God. So you will be on the same level as them. If you consider them as dogs, you will also be one of the dogs. If you hold on to the Mosaic law. So he's basically, that's the statement that he's making. So he's, he's equating them uh, with, um, with, with the dogs in the sense, the same status that they had given to the others, they are now going to be having that same status themselves as well if they choose to hold on to the law. The second thing that he says, you know, he calls them mutilators of the flesh because the Jewish people regarded themselves as the circumcised people of God. For them, circumcision was a mark of honor. It is a mark that set them apart as the chosen people of God. But now, Paul says, 
that circumcision that you you know that you consider something so valuable and something that's so respectable it's it's just a mutilation and the term that he is using is again very very derogatory because um mutilation is something that you do to the enemy you know during a war um uh when um, when you would have two two um you know armies fighting each other uh the the victorious army uh, when it captures the you know the the defeated uh, enemy soldiers it would mutilate them you know cut off certain organs you know um, um maybe you know uh, uh mutilate them in some way or the other so that term is now being used over here by paul that's the greek term that he uses over here so he says what you have always considered as a very as a mark of respect you know the circ circumcision now it's no longer a mark of respect now it's just a mutilation it's basically what you this derogatory thing which you do to your enemies that's basically what it is now it's no longer a mark of respect so when he calls them dogs and when he calls them mutilators he is equating them with the gentiles whom they have looked down upon all their lives so he's saying you you're you're in no way different or any better than the gentiles if you choose to hold on to the law now because now the new covenant has come in so you got to accept the fact that the old covenant is gone and now you got to submit to jesus and place your faith in him and give up on the old covenant and if you're not willing to to do that you're now on the same level as the gentiles whom you have despised all your life uh is the point that you know he he's trying to make so if if you if, if there were any judaizers listening to this letter when it was being read out to the congregation these terms which paul uses would have hit them they would have understood what paul is saying when he's speaking these uh words so um he says in verse 3 for it is we believers you know it is we who are the circumcision we who serve god by his spirit who boast in christ jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh so now who are the circumcised the the judaizers they're just mutilated that's it they're not even circumcised on the other hand the believers who are probably many of them gentiles who are not even circumcised in the flesh they are actually the circumcised now so this this honorable title of circumcised people is no longer being held by the people who have a physical circumcision rather it's the believers who get to have this honorable title of being called the circumcised people of god so paul is saying it is we believers who are the circumcision we are the ones who serve god by his spirit um so uh this was a concept in fact which god introduced in the old testament itself he never said that just physical circumcision is enough i mean if you go back to the old testament right from old testament times itself he made it very very clear that simply undergoing a physical ceremony of circumcision is not going to set you apart for god uh we see that right in deuteronomy itself uh, so in fact if we could have any one person read out that for us um Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 15 and 16 Deuteronomy 10 15 and 16 please The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them and he chose their descendants after them you above all peoples as it is the day therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff necked no longer so right then in the mosaic law when when god first established that mosaic law that time itself he was very very clear what kind of a circumcision he is is talking about yes they would be physically circumcised but that is pointing towards the circumcision of the heart that is the important thing so at that time the lord says to them please circumcise your hearts and stop being stiff necked we talked about that earlier right in one of our classes a stiff neck is one which is you know which refuses to bend 
and you bend your neck and you submit and say, okay, I accept what you're saying. Oh Lord, I humble myself and I repent. That shows that you have a um, willingness to learn, that you have a willingness to correct yourself. On the other hand, a stiff-necked person is one who, who, who sticks up their neck and says, no, I refuse to listen to what you're saying. I refuse to accept what you're saying. I refuse to bow to what you're saying. So um, the Lord says right in Deuteronomy itself, you need to circumcise your hearts. And the same thing is talked about in Ezekiel 44, 9, you know, where it says, um, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart and flesh is to enter my sanctuary. It was not enough that people should be circumcised in the flesh. They also needed to be circumcised in their heart. So both heart circumcision and flesh circumcision were required in the Old Testament. So now, why are believers called the circumcised people of God? Because we have chosen to submit to the Lord Jesus. So in that sense, our hearts are circumcised. So now it's no longer important to have to be physically circumcised. That's not required anymore. Because in the heart itself, believers have now chosen to become circumcised. So believers are the true circumcision. They are the true circumcised people of God now. And they have now... They are now serving him by his spirit. Because if you remember, again, going back to your uh, uh, Ezekiel, there we are told that um, in Ezekiel 36, verse 27, it says, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. So to the believers today, the Holy Spirit has been given and he moves us in our inner person to follow him, to obey him. So in that manner, because of the work of the Holy Spirit inside us, we have become the true circumcision. So therefore, we don't boast in physical circumcision. We don't boast in the Old Testament laws which we are keeping. What do we boast in? It says over here in verse 3, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh whatsoever. So our confidence is not in whether we are circumcised or not. Our confidence is in Jesus Christ and the work which he has done on the cross for us. That has made us into his people. So uh, we are not dogs anymore. Whether we are Gentiles or Jews, we are no longer dogs. We are rather God's people because of what he has done on the cross for us. Okay, so, um, so those are the points which... Uh, Paul is trying to bring out over here um, in this third in this third verse way when he says that the believers are the circumcised uh, people of God. Mm, yeah, I think maybe we can just stop over here. Um, all right, yeah. So yeah, let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for. Uh, the many things that we have learned from this letter to the Philippians. We pray, Lord, that just like the Philippian believers, uh, we would offer our sacrifices and service to you. We pray that whatever we give to you will be like a pleasing aroma unto you. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, we would not see ourselves as an audience and leave all the ministry work to the leadership but we would actively do whatever we can from our side, even though it may involve opposition. So like the Philippians, oh Lord, we pray that we would be brave. We would not give in to, the, uh, to fear because people are uh, against us, but that we would go forward and do whatever we can from our side uh, to promote the kingdom of God. And we pray, oh Lord, that even as we are doing this, um, it would be like an honorable uh, offering unto you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.